You're listening to She's the Business Podcast. Okay, and I'm here with the lovely Emma Houston of Ready to Boss Legal. Welcome, Emma. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Hi, thanks for having me. It's okay. Now, I understand Ready to Boss Legal is quite a new name, um, but before we dive into the reason for changing your name and all of these interesting insights that you have through this process of deciding to rebrand. I'd love you just to share with us a little bit about who you serve um, now and what it is that you do in your business. I'm a lawyer and an online entrepreneur. So we have a really well-defined niche helping women with online businesses create the legal foundations they need to get them to be free, to be ready to boss and make those CEO moves in their business. Mm -hmm. Um, And we do that through both customised work and legal templates, and that helps us service a wider variety of clients depending on their needs and business stage. Mm -hmm. Yes, one of those essentials I guess we all need to have in our business um, are the legals done and that's interesting that you've got a mixture of customized versus templates. Is there a, like, what do you see the demand for mostly? What's the reasoning for the different offerings? Um, what, you know, I was aware of after 22 years as a lawyer now is that there are a lot of people that can't afford a lawyer and they really need a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Or there are people that are doing, you know, they're starting a website, but a template's going to be okay. So what I've done is looked at what can be templated to make it more affordable. Mm -hmm. But there's, you know, when you look at things, you go, well, actually that's too complicated or that's too unique. And then that's where the Mm -hmm. customised stuff comes in, which is what, you know, a lot of firms do custom, most firms do that. Um, it's just, we, we've sort of got that path, two pathways, a bit mm. like a choose your own adventure novel. And sometimes we will see someone who's starting a business. They don't know if it's going to work. So they might buy a template. Yeah. And then they, you know, six or 12 months go down the track and they're finding their feed and knowing exactly what they're doing and they'll come on with customised that yep. then so it can be a really good way to do that or someone who's really savvy and they know their way around a non-disclosure agreement or but they just need the form and they need to know it's been properly drafted by a lawyer not copied off their friend who got it off their cousin <laughs> kind of thing <laughs> yeah yeah exactly and I think that that's so true that there are you know, especially if there would be a simple business that, you know, it's not complicated when we're not doing really customized agreements based on what the specific service offering is. But if it's like, you know, website terms and conditions or your your NDA, Mm -hmm. um, they lend themselves to being templated, which is kind of good for you as well, because it means that you're not spending your time on these things that are you know, I guess the the lower level um, jobs or projects coming through, you can say, yep, we've got a template for that. And then if they have any questions or they could do little adjustments to it, but then you can spend your time on much more meaty um, projects and, and really where the customized advice comes in. Um, so I can imagine it's a win-win for everybody to do that. That's right. And sometimes some people will come to us and I'll have a few jobs and we'll go, well, actually we've got a template for this, but this other thing, that's not a template that's actually got thorns all over it and we need to make sure you're protected. So it it just helps, um, you know, open the opportunities. And some people are happy with a template and some people go, no, no, I don't. I just want you to do it all. Go take it. Do it. So (laughs) it just gives people that choice, which is really, really good. And sometimes that choice means that they can afford something they wouldn't have had without the Mm -hmm. template so yeah you know customized is always better but if you can't put it or or you you're going to be pretty standard um then a template is definitely better than no protection at all yes yes absolutely now we were going to discuss your rebrand today because i think you know it's such an interesting thing to change your business name and i guess ditch a brand that you've created and you've got out there and you know you've got 
some brand equity that you've built up and to change to a new name, um, it's a big decision. And it's something I know a lot of people think about at times and think about a lot and wonder, oh, should I do it? Shouldn't I do it? The pros and cons, there's so many. So can you tell us a bit about what did your business start out being called? Um, and yeah, how did that, that all come about? So in 2019, early 2019, well before COVID had happened, yeah. I um, set up a business called The Remote Expert and I had written a book um, about working from home called The Tracksuit Economy. And when I set it up, I sort of was envisaging helping people with remote work. And at that time, remote work was really different to, to how it is now. And, but when I started, a lot of my clients were actually people just like me, women who had an online business, predominantly working from home, but also, you know, all over the place or like you're doing at the moment, travelling around Australia in a a caravan. And um, it, it became, we were actually helping them with their website terms, with their online course terms, um, all of that kind of stuff. And, you know, the remote expert was still sort of accurate because most of them, are, you know, have remote teams. So like me, I've got a team in Hong Kong and Gold Coast. Uh, but it just wasn't, you know, and we would have to explain. I, and I purposely, purposely at the time didn't put legal in it because I didn't know what shape the business would take. And I think that's the real issue when you start a business. It, what? What are you going to be doing if you had the gift of hindsight four years later then mm. easier to name a business? Mm-hmm. Um, so it was working and, I'm, you know, my personal brand in the legal industry and in the online business space is relatively strong. So that sort of carried it through. And then COVID hit and instead of 8% of the population remote working, a lot of whom were the business owners like you and I, um, about 40 to 50% of people now work from home all the time. And it's it's a re- got a really different meaning, I think, since COVID. And maybe not the best connotation because there's that argument now about bringing people back to the office. And uh, Whereas my clients, we, they never have an office. They have an office, but they never have, it, you know, like an office in, mm. in the city kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So I was sort of was like, oh, so a year ago we re- we refreshed our logo, which did help a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but then we were still getting calls, you know, what, what, oh, the remote expert, what do you do? Do you help place VAs? Do you place IT people? Like we're lawyers. So um, that, you know, it was really time to own the legal and I, I sort of, have been planning to launch some masterclasses and some other things and mm. another book, but I'm like, oh, I actually don't want to publish it as the remote expert. And I was getting asked to speak on remote work and I was refusing those engagements. I'm like, no, it's actually time. It is actually time. The refresh carried us through another year, but it is just time yeah. to do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd started to cringe when I would hear the, the remote expert. Um, yes. Oh, that's a big sign, isn't it? It yeah. is. It and is. it just sounds like um, interesting just what other people were perceiving. You know, the, mm. the clarity there wasn't evident for them straight away. Mm. And so, yeah, it's it's quite interesting for you to have been getting so many different perceptions that people had on what your business was or what it meant. It is. And then, you know, they get it when we when I explained it, but it was having to explain it. It's Mm -hmm. like having to spell your surname. I've sort of grown (laughs) up with the whole Houston, we have a problem and going, no, no, it's with an EU instead of an OU, like the place in America. (laughs) So, um, you know, and then it was like doing that with the business. Oh, no, we've just got to do something that people go, all right, good. Mm -hmm. Um, And and that is more aligned to us and our clients. um, because our clients and a, and a lot of people I know in the remote work space, uh, you know, they've changed a bit their focus a bit. I think since COVID, because it used to be really niche, and now it's kind of a bit more mainstream. So you've got to look at a different way of expressing that. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so we came up with and ready to boss legal wasn't our first. It's it sort of ended up being my favorite, but it was actually our second name choice. Oh right. So tell me about that. <laughs> um so we had our first name choice, and that was um I thought, yeah, I like I like that. And coming up with a name was actually really hard. Mm-hmm. Really hard, harder than it was when I started. Because when you start, you're kind of like, "Yeah, that'll do." And, then, <laughs> and now you're like, "I don't want to do this again." So I need to find yeah. something that's good. <laughs> yeah, and when you've got all that goodwill and equity in your business, it it is actually more of a valuable asset to kind of mm. rename. Yeah. So I had we had the name. I'm like, right. And being a lawyer, it was it's been really interesting because we help people. Um, you know, people who are starting up, thinking of names for the first time, um, people like us rebranding or people naming, you know, programs or memberships in within their business. And I always sort of look at, well, what do we need to do? And my advice to, and I had to follow my own advice, which was, was actually really, really good from a, a user perspective to kind of you know, understand from this angle what our clients are going through with each step. Mm-hmm. Um, so what we, you know, we, we had sort of the technical things. So what do we do about our trading names? And before that we had a company and a trading name mm-hmm. and I could have just registered a new trading name, but I was like, no, I was simplifying things. So I actually changed the company name and dropped the trading name. So we, I did that with ASIC and then we've got to tell the Law Society and our insurer and all these bits and pieces as well. Bank then, account. <laughs> yeah, yep. And all you have that. to go into the bank instead of, <laughs> oh, my God, of us, kind you, of you know, crazy well Yeah, <laughs> with all your ASIC stuff. And I hadn't been in there for about <laughs> probably since we opened the bank account four years ago. So... Mm. That, that's all time consuming but then you've got all your brand assets and if you think about well what what are those touch points how do people find me so you've got your website mm. and as I always tell people go on and re- just buy your domain and buy the .com the .com au the .co the .au they're about you know they're only about eight dollars a year if you buy a bundle and for these extras each and that means that no one else can come and get that. And you know, your.com.au, their.com, there's a bit of brand confusion and redirecting mm. going on. You just want to claim all of those domains. And mm. when you look, you should be prepared to buy on the day you look because there are bots that crawl the website searching, the domain searching sites that might you might look at something and go, that's great, I'll come back to it. You look, come back three days later and it's gone. And then someone will try and sell it to you Mm -hmm. for a higher rate. So it's always good just to snap them up. And I own, yeah, double lots of domains because we changed it. And so I did that with the first option. And then, um, you know, then I'm like, okay, I've got the domain. Okay. that, And I looked up Instagram and Facebook. That should be okay. And then I looked up the trademark register. And you don't have to have a trademark. You can trade as long as you're business name or your company name is the same as your trading name you can use that but um it is an issue if someone starts say i open up as ready to boss legal and someone else then opens up stuff gets a trademark um and we've had a client last week who we lodged a trademark for she started trading in 2020 and then just instructed us recently oh it's time i did my trademark we put it in, but in August this year, so two years after she started trading, someone else had had um, put in an application to trademark her trading name. So now it's. I think it'll be okay. She's got a prior use application mm. and an objection, but she could have just done it in 2020 and got it through and it would have been okay. But now she has two applications and she's got to fight for that business name that she has been using since 2020. So that was, in my mind, I knew that could happen. So, and I looked, and there on the trademark register for this first name we'd chosen was a a trademark with a logo 
but um, registered to a, a lawyer in Brisbane. I was like, okay, I'm searching around. I couldn't really find much web presence. I'm like, well, maybe he's just registered and not used it because they can. It was a few years old and they last for 10 years. So I found it, I, I couldn't really find much, but I sent him a letter. Um, and even his email, we did find bounce back. I'm like, this is weird. I'm just going to we'll send him a letter in the in the mail. So we sent a snail mail letter and um, he wasn't happy <laughs> because we said, we want to use this name. We can see you're not really using it from our sets. So his email bounced back. And then so we sent him a snail mail. And we asked for consent to register the business name, noting that he, he wasn't really using it um, from what we could see online as evidence. And anyway, I got an email back. It was pretty angry. <laughs> <laughs> sort of saying, you know, he has a master's in intellectual property law and he does litigation and he's happy to fight it and all these things. I was like, wow, okay, well, I really just wanted, it was a bit of an exploratory thing to work out if this was going to be a problem. Clearly that was the answer was, yes, it's going to be a problem. Let's go yeah. with a plan B. <laughs> um, so, I, you know, I had bought, at that point I had only bought the domain. So I'm down about you know, $70 mm. from that business and rather than thousands of dollars on logos and switching yes. websites and that kind of thing. So I, we then sort of came up with Plan B, which is ready to boss legal, which I actually am pleased that we were sort of forced to think a bit more deeply because I, I do actually like that better. Um, and then I did the searches, lodged a trademark head start application, got um, got the green light on that and, and had an early acceptance before we did all the of trademark, before we did all the brand changing. And that just gave me that reassurance that, you know, it, it was going to be okay, you know, that that, mm. that wouldn't be there. And, and I'm just so grateful that we didn't, you know, get the logo just announce the new name, rebrand, re and then... Um... So glad that you did that research and really looked into it um, in all of the levels, um, not just the, the business register, but actually going to the trademark register. To mm. We okay. froze. <laughs> <laughs> we were at that going to the trademark register. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, yeah, so it was really great that you went to the trademark register and could check that there was actually a trademark so that you didn't go through all that process. Like you say, it's so costly, not only with time, but and also, you know, it can be a confusing message. You only want to deliver that message once to your audience, like, hey, we're changing our name and not to have to do that again because that would really have confused um, your people out there if you had to change oh, the names yeah. twice. So that's a and really great lesson. And it's so disruptive to do that because all the, you know, we're still going. We still are waiting for letterhead and business cards and slowly going through because we've got all these custom illustrations in our old brown colours on our website, which we've got to update into new. So there's just all these things sort of... Um, Free downloads, which are branded with the remote, you know, everything just has brand touch points. So it's not, you know, just Facebook and Instagram will change that name and, you know, we'll change the letterhead in the website and that's it. It's actually quite a bit and we're just catching them as we go now but it was even all the software logins mm. and the email addresses on all the platforms you use like you zero oh, wow. yes. legal practice <laughs> management stuff like all of that stuff so we're still going oh yes. behind the scenes there <laughs> Yeah, yes. but we're, we're at the point where it's got the emails, we're functioning day to day as, and then we're just changing it as we sort of go with a few more bits and pieces. Yeah, it's amazing. Now, you did touch on something that I thought would be worth exploring because you, know, you said, well, particularly with things like the domain name, like, what, you know, you advise your clients to register the domains. Now, for an Australian company trading in Australia, you know, the .com, the .com AU makes sense. But then we're getting so many businesses now that are really trading internationally. And I don't know how many people are aware, but, you know, when you're getting into things like trademarks, they are actually quite restrictive, as in, 
you can trademark a name or a logo or symbol, um, but you only trademarking it within one country's mm-hmm. jurisdiction, if I'm correct, and also yes. within one industry as well. So, you know, I think that there's um, uh, this perception out there that if you own the trademark, you kind of own it and that's it. You own it globally because we we see these huge companies, you know, mm-hmm. like the, the Virgins or the Cadbury's and, the you know, there's huge big global brands that, that obviously own their name, but would they have gone to every country that they see as a market and registered trademarks in every single one of them, do you think? Um, how yeah, they-, they, they would have. So we do we do Australian trademarks, but there are international, like you said, so Australia's got trademarks and the classes are all similar across all countries. Um, mm-hmm. And there's 45 different trademark goods and classes. So you've got to sit down and work out goods and services. So, you know, the yeah. last, I think, 35 to 45 are services and the first 35 are goods, but they're so specific. So you've really got to work out, well, what, which classes do I need? Because you pay per class for IP Australia registration fees, so it gets mm. really expensive. But then, like you said, once you get it in Australia, okay, do we go globally? So there's a couple of ways you can go direct to that country and if it's just one or two other countries you trade in then we say okay we'll go and find an eight we'll find an agent there or you can find a trademark um, attorney in that country and you can do that application in the country because that's probably going to be the cheapest but if it's going to be a lot of countries then you can look at what we call a Madrid application which um, Australia is party to all these treaties and conventions that, mm-hmm. um, and that's a central place based in Switzerland and they charge in Swiss francs so you've got to calculate <laughs> the fees and pick your countries but then, and then search on the World Intellectual Property Organisation database for because what you know ready to boss legal might be fine here but if I went to the US and I don't trade in the US and I don't have plans to, so I won't worry. But if I went to the US, I might not be able to get it there. Mm, so Interesting. Yeah, it's it's mm. pretty tricky. And, and if you look at, say, someone like the Wiggles, um, you know, they've got trademarks in all sorts of categories because they've got merchandise. So they sing, they've got records, but they've also got TV shows and shirts and drink bottles and plates. And if you think yeah. about every bit of merchandise they have, yeah, pretty substantial. It can be, and I think that's the thing is like there, there probably isn't a way to completely reduce your risk to nothing, or I'll say not eliminate it. I don't think we can eliminate the risk of someone else no. starting up a business in your name. That's just um, not realistic because to get protection everywhere would be insane. It would cost you so much money, and so for most yeah. of us who have got our own business, you know, it's where do you think is you know like. Do people need one or are there other forms of protection around their brand that they might be able to utilise before going down that path if they think, oh, well, trademark sounds good, but then it's not as practical because it's really not protecting Mm. me against much at all um, unless they were to look into a global one. Yeah. So I guess it's sort of, you know, levels of protection. So if you trade in your own name, then Mm -hmm. it's unlikely someone's going to get confused with you but if you want to say protect it for us well we didn't really want anyone having a similar sound sounding name in our industry within Australia where you know my practicing certificates in Australia so that wasn't going to be you know we yes. were sort of handy confined geographically <laughs> yeah so and we knew there's I think two categories we're right mm. we're working in these categories mm-hmm. but yeah if if it was or something really general so if it was something really descriptive so if I said the cold water company something I would never get that trademark because it's not unique and and people would need those words in everyday language so that's not going to work if you want to trademark that so you'd look at Mm. well is there a distinctive logo which is uniquely you that you can use as part of that um they're the sort of conversations we have as as to whether it's worth it will they bother um Mm. what are their plans so a registration lasts for 10 years for a trademark so it's quite a good you know once you've got it and then Mm -hmm. the the renewal is only the trademark fee so it's Mm -hmm. actually a really good protection so i think but it's only one piece of a big jigsaw puzzle Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um 
we've all got so, so in intellectual property law there's trademarks copyright design and patents and patents are really kind of technical scientific things about how things work yeah design is is really the look of something um, and copyright is is what we all write. So as soon as we write something, we've got automatic protection under the Copyright Act. So it's really important on your website to have a, you know, copyright all rights reserved with your business name or your name and the year with that, that C symbol. Um, and say you've got course materials, so you've got an online program. If you give out resources, it should have copyright mm. there as well. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something you can do without a lawyer that's something everyone should be thinking about and also then you've got website terms and conditions so you know if someone your terms of use of your website are that it's information and you're not going to come and copy you're not going to come and take all their information and plagiarize it mm. and compete with someone so that and same with um terms and conditions so for online programs or working with someone you know there's all there's all of those ways in your documentation to protect you yeah. as well. Um, but I think it's it's really brings back a really interesting question about, well, did especially digital assets, who owns them? So a brand, a logo, but also um, if you say you and I ran a joint webinar um, or a joint course and we each contributed some of the videos and the content and worksheets. Well, who owns what? Do we, especially if we worked on them together, who owns those things? So mm -hmm. every mm -hmm. time you create something or give something to a client, so if you say build websites, you'd be transferring that website to a client. So your agreement should cover that transfer of the document. Same with a graphic designer, you know, our, our website illustrator. We buy those illustrations to use, but is she licensing them or transferring them? So all of these things, are, and they're all part of our brand, but that's, you know, how she makes money in her business. So as she's a creator, yeah, so... Yeah, it's, it's really, really interesting, isn't it? Mm, mm. It is. So I see a lot with like yeah. photographers, I think, is probably yeah. one of the ones that I think yeah. is commonly they like to retain the rights to photos that they take. Um, however, they're taking them for you to mm. use in your business. So mm. whenever I'm getting photo brand photos done for my business, then I request that I own the rights to the photos because mm. they're my photos <laughs> um, and that I might give them the right to use them for their business, but not yeah. for other purposes. You know, um, I might say, yes, it's okay that you can promote me as one of your clients, but um, apart from that, I own the rights to the photos because, you know, for me, that's really important. That's, uh, they're my that's photos right. and they're of me. <laughs> so I want to own that's them. That's <laughs> right. And you want to um, use them in your social media. You don't want to then have to pay. And I, and I think in the, mm. you know, not so much now, I think people are a little bit more, savvy in terms of ownership but in the old you know used to have photos taken and if you wanted more reprinted of your wedding photos then you'd have to pay the photographer to print them there was that, that kind of mm. thing and I think the school photos they still do that kind of stuff and they charge you $50 for one photo so. oh that's crazy isn't it <laughs> yeah so yeah. but that that's right so yeah just that ownership and the brand your brand is so much more than a logo or a name it is just every touch point that people see and and that's all digital or intellectual property so our templates mm. are digital product mm -hmm. and, and any you know anything from I was looking at a gift for one of my team members who's into crochet and I was looking at crochet patterns you could buy and download again a digital template but completely different to what I sell which are yeah. label templates yeah um, but still it's got all that all that intellectual property and mm. protecting that that's part of a brand that's part of a brand as well mm. I have a question for you that um just popped up because I thought there are some things that seem like they're quite easy to protect and that you could take action against. Um, however, what would you say if somebody, and this has actually happened to me, so I'm really interested to know your answer, but someone set up an Instagram account in my name and basically used all my photos off my business account, of me, of my kids, um, <laughs> things that I oh, share. Wow. 
And then they started contacting my followers um, as me and, mm. you know, messaging them obviously to get them to follow them. Um, and it only got picked up because some people who know me well knew that they were already following me and mm. they sort of flagged it and went, were well, you aware of this account? Um, now I, of course, you know, mm. reported it to Instagram and blocked them and, and whatever else. Um, but that doesn't really stop them from, mm. I don't know if the account's still there. Last I looked, Instagram doesn't take them down straight away. In fact, I'm not really sure how much they're, they're yeah. doing. That. So I was thinking, oh, maybe I should have sent them a message of like, hey, yeah. you know, well, cease and desist from using my photos. They're my personal photos. What kind of legal grounds would I have to tell them to stop stealing my photos and purporting as me? And I suppose if they'd stolen them from your website, my answer is going to be different if they stole them from Instagram because the minute we all sign up to Instagram and Facebook and the meta universe, <laughs> then we're giving our right. We, we're subject to their terms and conditions and we're giving our rights to them mm. a lot. Mm. Um, you would still be able to contact them privately, but really taking it down, you know, it's going to have to go through meta and that's a really it's always really interesting to think well make sure that you've got copies of everything at home make sure you've got an email list try and get people off that platform into your mailing list and your your mm. internet real estate that you own um, because really it's it's down to Facebook and I've had clients who've had business business names really similar business names come up and, and contact Facebook and say can you take them down they're, co they're copying what we're doing and Facebook and Instagram they're owned by the same people won't do anything until you've got a registered trademark and then you've got to produce the trademark so that's tick in the pros column of a trademark because otherwise they you know they say well you're entitled to use that and you know, this mm. has been the case where it might be you know, you might be white, white, blue, and then someone else might be white, blue, co. They are technically different. You could probably still register business names. Yes. Um, both of them, but, but they're, they are different, but it would be easy to confuse those. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you do have some, if you don't have a trademark, you do have some common law rights around if someone is passing off. Um, which means that they're trying to be misleading and deceptive and, and copy you and pretend to be you to get work or money. But it's also, you know, it's pretty hard to do. And you've actually, it's one thing to be right legally as well, but then you've actually got to get them off the platform. You, yes. You've got to get them to cease and desist. And mm. how do you make, if someone won't, Mm -hmm. you know, how do you make them do it? You can't make them take it down. So that's when you're back to Instagram to get yeah. them to take it down. So interesting because, you know, I would assume that they're probably not local. They're probably somewhere international mm. and therefore our law probably doesn't um, have any. Exactly. So um, that, And that's what I'm thinking. And I was also thinking you, mm. you might not know. It's probably a, I think there's a lot of spam accounts that do that. Mm -hmm. Medibank and Optus, you know, and hackers and scams. You know, probably you wouldn't know who to send it to anyway. Oh no, no. You, I would yeah. think. Well, the only way you could contact them would be actually to message that account mm -hmm. um, and let them know that you know that, that's right. That, that, oh, you're, and they'd be like, oh, so so what? Pay me. Well, pay me money <laughs> to take it down, which is probably going to be the next. Right. Yes. Yeah. That's so true. In the yeah. kind of the ransom, mm. kind of, it's sort of like a, I suppose a social media form of ransomware. Yes. When people oh, steal information. Think yeah. of that. But you, you're so right. They probably are doing it for that exact reason. Well, I hope that for me blocking them it meant that they could not continue to steal my photos and they could only have the ones that they'd already got. We'll see. But and it's tough because you use your name, so you're not really going to go and trademark your name because it's yours. Um, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. And so I had to, when I reported it, I actually had to take a photo of myself holding my driver's license. <laughs> <laughs> and submit it as proof that I am who I am, um, which, mm. you know, obviously I'm fine to do. But I put in the application a couple of times because nothing happened and I could see mm. that they hadn't actioned it and it was still pending. So I'm not even sure how they're resourcing that. Um, but, 
you know, that's for me something, you know, it's, it's just interesting to know about. Like we can't stop things like that happening. Like the same no. as you can't stop someone from copying you. Yeah. And not doing the research of- and just starting a business under your business name without realizing that they're probably, mm. uh, you know, against the trademark. Oh. Like it can still happen yeah. because a lot of people don't do the G diligence well I can't say those or words. they do it or they just don't care so they might go oh well who cares or I might get some more clients yeah. but really it's not helpful to either business if, if no. that's the case mm. um, yeah. especially if you in the same industry and mm. well, one of my clients is going through a rebrand as well and part of it has been brought on by the fact that it's a similar name to another business that's not actually related at all or not even in the related category and they do get a lot of contact from people Mm -hmm. looking for this other one so you know it it does pay I think to do Mm -hmm. your research before you choose your name Um, but it you know it's not going to avoid people in the future (laughs) starting a business and using the same name as you so it's it's just something really interesting I think um, you know to try to be as unique as possible like think well yeah what is unique so that you can really own that brand um, and that you can really form recognition around it so that, you know, should anybody start up something similar in the future, it's unlikely they're going to find or think of the same thing that you've thought of because it's so unique. So if you can, I think just spend that time doing your brainstorming, um, you know, brainstorm so many different names and, and come up with something that that you feel you can really own, I think. Absolutely. And then make sure you've got a digital footprint. It's sort of like when I looked up this other Mm. first choice name, couldn't find that. So I thought, you know, that's probably okay. But I, you know, also knew because of my background to look at the the trademark register, but I had to go to great lengths to contact him as well. If I'd just been like, oh, it'll probably be okay. Can't see him. (laughs) Yes. It probably wouldn't have been okay. No. Um, yeah. Mm. And the other thing I think is really handy is sign up to a Google alert for your business name. Not only does it sort of show if you've been mentioned in a news article or online somewhere in a review, it does also show if someone else is starting to use that name and you can yes. keep it in the bud rather than finding out a year later and they're already established. Yes, that's so true. Because I think if you contact someone early on, it's not mm. such a big deal for them to change. And they might have made an honest mistake, mm. um, you know, not realised. And But if you leave it and they've established, um, then it's going to become much harder to find a way that, you know, you both are happy or, or to get them to, to change and, later. And it's different. It's different if it's just a name that's a bit similar or you look at their website and they have copied all your text over and all your photos and it looks the same. (laughs) There's that very different Mm -hmm. kind of like honest mistake or actual plagiarism. Plagiarism. Yeah, as to how, I suppose how they'll receive it, but also how you need to then get serious about that. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Wow, that's so interesting. Um, So many things that we've covered here. Do you have anything else that you'd think is a really great tip for somebody who's thinking about rebranding, interested in trademarks, something that you'd say just to give them that little piece of advice on what to what to do? So what we do, um, we started doing a lot, and it's really similar to what I did for myself, is to do a trademark investigation. Mm-hmm. which looks at the proposed name but also the proposed logo because it can be that, you know, we had the uh, two letters in a logo that we had to get rid of and just have the words for it to get through at trademark. So oh, there's all wow. these really quirky things you haven't thought about um, mm-hmm. and that almost strength tests it as well because it might sound really good to you but then someone sort of examines it that way yeah it's worthwhile doing and the way we structure ours is if we do a trademark investigation then report then that comes if they go then go ahead with the trademark we credit that again I would suggest that or, or yourself search the IP Australia register if you are thinking of a business name and not just a business name um we help a lot of clients who have program names so you might have a mastermind that you name Mm. or um, an online course and that 
you know, that space is getting really crowded. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it's worthwhile. Worthwhile yeah. protecting that because we've had a lot of clients. Unfortunately, one of them had a trademark saying, look, this person, and it just, she sent us the, the landing page of this other person who pretty much copied a lot of the language and the words. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, it is. It's really easy for that. It's not just a business name. There's some elements with all offerings within your business that are really vulnerable as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think especially if you're building um, a product that you've got some real brand equity around, so, you know, you're Mm. using that name and building awareness and recognition of it, then you want to protect that, absolutely, because, yeah, what's stopping someone else from having a product with the same name as yours? It's um, Yeah, and physical products as well as mm, um, online stuff. That's great. Yeah, so if someone wants to get your help with a trademark investigation they can reach out um tell us where they can find you how can they get in touch so we're at ready to boss mm-hmm. and um also on instagram ready to boss legal and facebook but also we've got the best email to grab us on is boss team at ready to boss awesome thanks so much emma i think this has been such an interesting um, episode. We've really talked so much about the whole rebranding process. And, you know, I think we often uh, focus so much on the visuals and the design, and you know, the fun part of rebranding um, and kind of forget about the legal aspects and the business side of it. So this is, you know, just so useful and helpful for anybody who's in that process of um, thinking about a rebrand in 2023, um, you know, definitely reach out to Emma, especially if you're in Australia, ask her for some advice. Um, you can get her help with the trademark investigation and even with the application if you decide to go ahead with applying for your trademark. And in another, you know, the advice is still pretty transferable to another country. So if they are in another country, go and speak mm. to someone like me in that con- in your country where you live. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's very transferable, I think, as well. Yes, Mm. you're right. So good. Well, thank you, Emma. I really appreciate your time um, spending with us today. So thank you for joining us and um, we hope to hear from you soon. Thank you. Do you know something? There are so many people that are overcomplicating their marketing, which means that they're running on the marketing treadmill, pumping out so much content, but still not yielding those results. Meaning there are no clients actually signing up. Like what use is an audience if they're not an audience of buyers? What use is it creating great content to share if the people who are reading it have no desire to take that next step? to actually working with you. Well, if any of those things are happening for you right now, then it's highly likely that you're simply missing a key in your marketing strategy. And those keys are really simple. There are just five of them. And it's about how you align them, put them together. That is the simplicity that makes everything work, just like clockwork, so that you have a consistent stream of what you would consider your dream clients, literally turning up in your inbox, ready to have a conversation, ready to sign up with you without you going out there to find them. So let's put an end to cold outreach. Let's put an end to searching for clients in Facebook groups. Let's put an end to just waiting around and relying on referrals to come through from other people. Because when you have that consistent stream of clients, then you're in the place of being able to choose. You've got an abundance of opportunity out there. And all we need to do is turn on the tap for your clients to find you. So I've created a brand new training and it's called Five Keys to Clients on Tap. So you can guess what it's about, can't you? Well, this one hour short training takes you through those five critical keys that you need to have in your business so that you do have clients on tap and not just any old client, the ones that you most want to be working with that are going to make you profitable, that are going to fulfill you, are going to make you feel like jumping out of bed every morning because you love your business so much. So you want in? All you need to do is head to jessicaosborne.com slash TMF for the magnetic formula. So TMF and 
get yourself into the next session that's running for this training. You honestly will not regret it. It is going to change your business, your life, if you've been experiencing any of those problems I mentioned before. Look forward to seeing you in there and let's do this.